In this video, we'll be looking at nuclear division, mitosis and meiosis, as well as inheritance. Let's get right to the first question. The diagram shows two cells undergoing nuclear division. So nuclear division here refers to either mitosis or meiosis. Let's look at cell P and cell Q. So the first question is to state the type of cells for cell P and cell Q. So they're clearly very different cells. So cell P is actually a plant cell. How do we know it's a plant cell? First of all, you can very clearly see that there is a cell wall. And the second thing is, you see here that there are no centrioles. There are no centrioles. These are centrioles. If you look at cell Q, you can see the centrioles. But there are none here. Plant cells do not have centrioles. So cell P is a plant cell, and the reason is it has a cell wall and no centrioles. Whereas when we look at cell Q, it's clearly an animal cell because it is exactly the opposite. There is no cell wall and there are centrioles. So this is how we differentiate them. Name the stage of nuclear division for cell P and Q. So when we're talking about the stage of nuclear division, let's look at cell P for a moment. Whenever you see the chromosomes lined up at the center of the cell, this is called, there's a line here, this is called the metaphase plate. So we already know what we're talking about. Metaphase plate at the equator of the cell. Then it is metaphase. So this is clearly metaphase. Now let's look at Q. Whenever you see the chromosomes being pulled to the poles of the cell, so you can see some sort of movement. These chromosomes are being pulled to the poles, to opposite poles. This is anaphase. However, this is not just any anaphase. If you look carefully, you will notice these two different shades of color here. This represents crossing over. Crossing over is an exchange of a part of the chromosome, a part of the homologous chromosomes in prophase 1 of meiosis. This only happens for meiosis. So this is how you distinguish between meiosis and mitosis based on diagrams. Normally when it's meiosis, the chromosomes will have shown that crossing over has taken place. So you simply see that if there is a small section of the chromosome with a different color, crossing over has occurred. And that will confirm that it is meiosis. Now how do we know whether it's meiosis 1 or meiosis 2? In meiosis 1, the homologous chromosomes are separating, not individual chromosomes. So if you compare between the two diagrams, you can see very clearly. On the left, for mitosis, single chromosomes are aligned at the metaphase plate, and they are going to separate into two. So they're going to become sister chromatids. But here, the full chromosomes are separating. Homologous chromosomes are being separated. So when homologous chromosomes are being separated, it is meiosis 1. For meiosis 2, it will be similar to mitosis. So you will see the cells arranged this way as well. One single chromosome, all single chromosomes align at the metaphase plate. And they are separating into sister chromatids as well. However, again, you will see that crossing over has occurred. You will see one short section at the end of the chromosome has a different color. This section, by the way, is known as the chiasma. The chiasma. So the st stages are cell P is metaphase and cell Q is anaphase 1. Anaphase one. Ah. Cell P divides three times. State the number of daughter cells produced. So when we are looking at cell division, cell P is of course mitosis, as we have established. P is mitosis. So when we are looking at mitosis, each time the cell divides, the number of daughter cells produced is double. So if we start with one cell, let's draw a diagram here. If you start with one cell, after one division, then you get two daughter cells. After the second division, you will get four daughter cells. And so on. So you can see each division, the number of cells actually doubles. So the way to find the number of 
daughter cells at the end of how many divisions? You use 2 to the power of the number of divisions. So since we have 3 times, 2 to the power of 3. So at the end of 3 divisions, starting with 1 cell, then we will get 8 cells. So this is how we do it. Now state the number of chromosomes in each daughter cell. Now this is actually very simple to do. The number of chromosome does not depend on the number of cellular divisions. Because we have to remember, in mitosis, the number of chromosomes is maintained. In meiosis, the number of chromosomes is halved. It becomes a haploid cell. But in mitosis, it remains as a diploid cell. So this solely depends on which nuclear division we are talking about, whether it is mitosis or meiosis. In our case, we are talking about mitosis because we are still talking about cell P. So since it is mitosis, the number of chromosomes in the daughter cell will be exactly the same as the number of chromosomes in the parent cell. So let's check to see cell P. Cell P has four chromosomes. So one, two, three and four. Four chromosomes. Therefore, the daughter cell will also have four. There's nothing to calculate here. Draw all the possible daughter cells at the end of cell division for cell Q. So now we are going to look at cell Q. We need to draw all possible daughter cells. So let's start at the beginning. So we started off with this. This is cell Q. Now, after the first division, so we are going to go through meiosis 1. After the first division, what we will get is, you just have to see these two chromosomes separate into one daughter cell and these two chromosomes separate into another daughter cell. So all we have is this. This is after meiosis 1. But this is not the complete cell division. It is going to divide again meiosis 2. This time is very similar to mitosis. So you can see the difference here. You can clearly see the difference between uh, meiosis 1 and 2 here. For meiosis 2, what's going to happen is the single chromosome is going to divide. But again, you can very clearly see crossing over has occurred. Alright, so what happens after meiosis 2? After meiosis 2, we will have four daughter cells. So the first one looks like this. So how do we do this? You just split this chromosome into half. So you take this this sister chromatid is going to become the chromosome in the daughter cell and this sister chromatid. So that's how we got this. We do the same thing for the next daughter cell. So we look at the bottom part. We have this sister chromatid and this sister chromatid which will become the chromosomes of the daughter cell. So what we have is this. And then we do the same thing for the other one as well. So we get this and this divided into two. So these are all the possible daughter cells that we get at the end of meiosis. We have four daughter cells at the end of meiosis, two daughter cells at the end of mitosis. Another cell, cell R, is in a stage of cell division as shown in the diagram below. So we can see clearly this is metaphase. Again, you see all the chromosomes aligned, it is metaphase. Chromosome M fails to separate in the next stage. Draw two daughter cells form at the end of the nuclear division. So here we have metaphase and during the next phase, after metaphase is anaphase. So remember he might. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase and finally telophase. So now we are at metaphase. The next stage is anaphase. P might. So at anaphase, they say that M fails to separate. So the chromosome does not separate to two sister chromatids. Now what will happen? So let's look at this. So first of all, after mitosis, what we get is two daughter cells. Now normally, each sister chromatid will become the chromosome in the next cell. However, in this case, M failed to separate. That means one of the two daughter cells will have the full chromosome instead of just a sister chromatid. So this is what it will look like. The others are still the same. The others is still, is still divided into two and take the sister chromatids. So we have the three other sister chromatids, but this is the full chromosome. So what will happen in the other cell? Since it didn't separate, 
the whole thing is in one cell, the other cell will be lacking one sister chromatid. So what we have is this. This is what it will look like. This is what the two daughter cells will look like if one fails to separate. Now let's look at inheritance. Mr. A has hemophilia. He got married to Mrs. A who is a carrier of hemophilia. Hemophilia is a disease where blood cannot clot properly. So this poses a significant threat because when blood cannot clot properly, then uh, spontaneous bleeding can occur and when bleeding occurs, of course there can be excessive loss of blood. In severe cases, this can result in death. So hemophilia is a genetic disease. Using the diagram, discuss the probability that their child will have hemophilia. So hemophilia, the gene for hemophilia is located on the X chromosome of the sex chromosomes. So it is an X-linked genetic disease. Let's look at this. So the question here is, using a diagram, they have to draw a genetic diagram, discuss the probability that their child will have hemophilia. Their child will have hemophilia. So here we are talking about inheritance of the disease. So let's look at this. First, we start by stating that hemophilia is in fact caused by a recessive allele on the X chromosome. So just a quick review. So let's use A as the dominant. This is the dominant allele and small a as the recessive allele. This is how it is normally represented. The capital letter is for the dominant and the small letter is for recessive. So we have dominant and recessive. In order for a dominant trait to show, there only has to be one dominant allele. We have to remember we are working on the basis of two chromosomes, homologous chromosomes and one chromosome from each parent. So when a characteristic shows, it depends on one set of alleles, one from each parent. So if you get one dominant and one recessive, this is known as heterozygous. So here we have the dominant trait showing because we have the dominant allele. What if you have both dominant, then of course the dominant trait is going to show. This is known as homozygous dominant. Homozygous dominant. In this case, the dominant trait will show. But when we have two recessive alleles, this is known as homozygous recessive. So in this case, it is the recessive trait that will show in the characteristic, not the dominant trait. So this is the only scenario where the recessive trait will show. Otherwise, it will be the dominant trait. So when we talk about hemophilia, hemophilia is due to a recessive allele on the X chromosome. And when we are talking about sex chromosomes, again we have to remember, for females, females have two X chromosomes and males have one X and one Y chromosome. So now we can start our diagram. So first we start with the parent generation. So we have the father and the mother. From the question, we know that the father has hemophilia and the mother is a carrier. So first we start with the phenotype. The phenotype is what is expressed, the characteristic that is expressed. So we have hemophilia and hemophilia carrier. Then we go to the genotype. Now here, the male has one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. This is why we write XY here. However, since the father has hemophilia and hemophilia is due to a recessive allele, this can only mean that the father has the recessive allele on the X chromosome. So we have X small h. This small h here is to represent the recessive allele. Whereas the mother is a carrier. If the mother is a carrier, she has one of each. One dominant allele and one recessive allele. So now after going through meiosis, this has to be mentioned. So during meiosis, there is gamete formation and during gamete formation, the number of chromosomes is halved. So the gametes will have only one of the two chromosomes. So the gametes can either form with this chromosome, which is the X, H, or the Y chromosome, and on the mother's side is the same as well. So you separate the chromosomes into gametes. So normally we circle the gametes. Then during fertilization, it, again this has to be mentioned, during fertilization, the gametes are going to come together and there is going to be 
fusion of the nuclei. So the sperm and the ovum, they will fuse their nuclei to form the offspring. And this will determine the genotype of the offspring. So the offspring genotype, we have to work out all possible combinations. So let's look at these. Here is just all a game of matching. So you take one gamete from the male and one gamete from the female. So each gamete, you will have two choices. So X, H, here, look at the purple line. This is one combination. The blue line is another combination. And then we go to the Y. So for the Y, we have one combination each as well. So the green line combination and the white line combination. So now we can determine the phenotype because we have the genotype. So now we can determine what characteristic is expressed. For the female here, the first one, XX is female. So here we have one dominant and one recessive. So this is going to be a female carrier of hemophilia. Then we have the second one, which is also female because XX. Here there are two recessive alleles. So this is homozygous recessive. When we're talking about homozygous recessive, of course, this means that she has hemophilia. This is a female with hemophilia. Now let's look at males. So this is XY. XY is male because we have one Y. As long as there's one Y, it is a male. And in this case, the male has the dominant allele. So when the male has the dominant allele, here there's only one allele that's going to determine the characteristic. So in this case, it is the dominant allele, so the male is normal. Normal in the sense that he does not have hemophilia. Whereas when we look at this last one here, it's also XY, which means male. In this case, we have the recessive allele only. So this male will definitely show the trait of hemophilia. This male has hemophilia. Because he only has one X chromosome, as long as the X chromosome contains the recessive allele, then the male will develop hemophilia. So this is a genetic diagram. Let's just look at it as a whole. So we always start with parent phenotype. This is like a sandwich. It's a mirror image from parent phenotype to gamete and then it is mirrored. So you can see we started with parent phenotype and we end with offspring phenotype. After phenotype, we go to genotype. So again, when you look at genotype, it is here as well. It's a mirror image. So we start with phenotype, then we go to genotype, and then we end with genotype and phenotype as well. And then in the middle, we have gamete formation. You have to explain the two processes, which is meiosis as well as fertilization. Now, we still haven't answered the question. So what is the probability of a child getting hemophilia? From this, we can see that out of the four possible genotype formation, we have two who have hemophilia. So carriers are not considered those who have hemophilia. So only two will have hemophilia, two out of four. So this is two out of four, which is of course 50%. So the probability of a child developing hemophilia is 50%, two out of four or you could write it as 0.5. That's it for this video, guys. I'll be doing another one on succession as well. So please look out for that. I will get it out as soon as possible. See you in the next video.